Um, just so you guys are aware, if you didn't get that notification, this session will be recorded. Um, the audience will not be recorded. It will be the um, presentation slides. Um, so we want to like let that be known for everyone attending for your comfort. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for coming. Tonight's session is going to be on community insight into New York State Green Amendment, and we're going to get into that, um, what that amendment is very soon. That's why we're here. <laughs> um, so um, a few things I wanted to cover. I already mentioned that the uh, presentation will be covered, will be recorded. And um, another thing that I wanted to mention is that um, this event is one of many that we act host, and the next is going to be a forum um, with um, grassroots specialists and um, audience made up of um, environmental lawyers, um, professors and students from Columbia, um, Pace University, and City College, and tentatively the New York Law Journal. And it's going to be on demystifying grassroots work um, in big green as it relates to um, through the lens of legal standing and community engagement and it's going to be awesome so if you're interested in that i've shared the registration link for that in the chat and please panelists included please feel free to register and um, join it's going to be a very riveting um engaging conversation i'm sure okay so let's be, we're, we're, well, first, let me say that this is hosted by We Act for Environmation uh, for Environmental Justice, uh, as you can tell by the logo. And we're going to have um, a representative from We Act staff to speak towards what is We Act the organization, what is their mission, um, and what informs even this presentation. So I'm going to pass it off now to Mary Lady to do just that. Thank you so much, uh, and welcome. Uh, I am the bilingual community organizer of WE Act, so I speak Spanish and English. Uh, since 1988, we have worked to build a healthy community by ensuring that people of color participate meaningfully in the creation of sound and fair environmental health and protection policy and practices. Uh, we do this, we are do the advocacy for policy change at local, state, and federal level, and this. On this, they focus on different, um, or we focus in different uh, areas, and we have the we achieve that through different working groups. So, I want to say something else. Through grassroots organize, organizing, community engagement, and policy advocacy, we add for environmental justice strive to bring about transformative change, ensuring equitable distribution of environmental benefit and resources for all, regardless of socioeconomic background or race. Thank you, Judy. Yes, thank you so much, Mary Lady. Um, on to the next slide. So um, the purpose of this presentation and this workshop is to educate and empower the community, our community, with an in-depth um, understanding and insight into New York State's New Green Amendment. Um, so we'll be doing this by highlighting the implications and benefits um, for the community, specifically um, as it relates to people of color, uh, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and low-income residents, um, a, a insight that can be utilized and should be utilized. Um, we'll also be gaining insight into the amendment by hearing from the developer, developers of the amendment from um, the Environmental Law Clinic of Pace University, and we'll also be gaining insight into more of the state and enforcement um, aspect and perspective of the amendment um, from our um, panelists from the New York State uh, uh, Attorney General's Environmental Bureau Office. So, so from their uh, Attorney Generals, um, they'll be speaking towards that aspect. Um, so the points we're going to cover is going to be first starting off with what is the Green Amendment. Some of you may know all that there is to know about it up until this point, but some may not know um, anything regarding it, which is why it's very important that we're all here to discuss it. So we'll be um, introducing what it is, and then we'll go into the um, impact and implications portion of it as it relates to our, um, you know, the to all New York residents with a focus on 
communities of color and low-income residents. Um, as I said, we'll go into how it's developed, the enforcement, and then afterwards, we'll be having a uh, Q&A session in which you can ask the panelists and if it relates the we ask staff um, questions regarding the amendment. And on that note, now is the time to scan the QR code here. So I'll give you about two to three minutes to, not two to three minutes, more like a minute to do that. <laughs> I just expect everyone to just scan the uh, code and um, you'll be met with a screen. You just enter your name and you write your questions down throughout the presentation. And these are the questions that we'll be utilizing in the Q&A session. Um, to uh, to gain even further insight from our panelists. So I'm going to give everyone a moment to do just that. I'm going to do it myself, you know, just to really make sure, but it sh everything should be okie dokie. But you should pop in the chat if you are having some kind of issue, just so we're aware. Because if that's the case, I'm sure you could just put it in the Zoom chat, but. Okay. And if Taisha, if you could hide the chat function. Yeah, for now. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm gonna give another 10 seconds and then we're gonna begin with the meat of the presentation. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, not the meat, gotcha. <laughs> First, before we get into the meat, let me introduce myself because I don't, you may not know, you, I'm sure you don't know who I am yet. My name is Julie Bazile and uh, my pronouns are she, they, and I am an um, incoming law student um, with a focus in environmental law and in my daily life, but still as it relates to environmentalism, I am an everyday advocate for the liberation of low-income communities of color and other marginalized communities. So this summer, I've been working for WE Act in their civic engagement department and organizing department. So wherein I've been, um, further executing their mission of ensuring access to healthy homes and healthy communities for our targeted audience and for all New York residents. And with that in mind, I was motivated to create this workshop with the help of um, all of the WE Act team to discuss New York's New Green Amendment because I found it um, very interesting and um, impactful and uh, not as talked about as I really hope it should be at this point. Um, I guess that's how it goes for most new things. Um, so besides me, let's get into our experts, our panelists. Um, so they're going to help us gain um, insight into the amendment, as I mentioned before. And um, so yes, for the development aspect, we have Professor Katarina Kuh, um, um, or Professor Q, and uh, she herself is a distinguished professor at Pace University. And she is just um, a brilliant mind, talented soul. Um, and I had the pleasure of listening to her speak when I was an undergrad and I just, yeah fantastic, um, fantastic mind. You'll get to see for yourself in a second. Next, we have um, Attorney General for the Environmental Protection Bureau for New York State, Sherry, um, Mary Sherry Shekhobo. Um, you know, I, I met her briefly, but um, from what I can see, she's very um, similar to what I said for Professor Cud, is very brilliant mind. It seems like she has a wide breadth of insight into um, environmental justice initiatives and um, um, everything that an attorney general for the environmental bureau like probably should know. Like, so yeah, like I really commend that. And next we have um, the attorney general um, Lem Lemol Shulovic, and um, I gotta make sure that I like uh, don't flop and sing just as much how um, intelligent and um, insightful that I'm sure he's going to be and has been um, in regards to the amendment. And like I said before, we have much to learn from um, these. Um, experts. So on that, we're going to kick it off into the first part of our session, which is what is the new Green Amendment? So um, in 2021, um, at the end of the year, um, we had an election and that election at the back of your ballots was the um, 
was the option to inscribe um, what's written here into our New York State Bill of Rights. And uh, over 2 million people voted to, to add the rights and access um, to clean air and water in a healthy full environment into our New York State um, Bill of Rights. And that has that's what's been done. And um, on that note though, New York State is one of very few states who have this affirmative right to a clean environment in its state's constitution. So um, this right has, um, it can be used and has been used to, um, to act against conflicting state and local laws, which can impact that right by, for example, um, in that, uh, or approving environmental permits that yeah, transgress this right. And we're gonna get into that um, now. So next slide. Um, I think a great way to look at its usefulness and its use and its intent is to look at how it impacts those who are historically um, disproportionately victims of hazardous sites, um, whether that be because of a lack of inclusive regulations or a purposeful lack of political agency, which is, um, you know, communities of color and low income residents. So this historical uh, environmental, historical and present day environmental racism has put minorities in unsafe health conditions. So the Green Amendment right establishes a comprehensive legal responsibility for all government officials, all government agencies and entities within the state. Um, and it, it mandates that they must always take into account and and protect people's entitlement to clean water, air, and a healthy full environment whenever they even contemplate taking any actions. So protecting our rights to clean water, air, and a healthy full environment when taking actions is now the legal obligation of New York State government officials and state entities. So uh, the New York State environmental right makes it harder for the government to approve projects that harm the public's access to clean air, water, and a healthy environment. It, it encourages them to be more vigilant um, in enforcing laws to prevent pollution at even existing facilities. So now government officials must now thoroughly consider whether projects or other government actions will be detrimental to environmental rights, even if there are existing legal protections, you know, such as um, CICRA, which is the environmental, uh, the environmental quality, uh, it, it requires environmental quality reviews, but it's known as the State Environmental Quality Review Act. Um, so this additional safeguard, it protects against, it further protects against loopholes or other gaps in protections that may and are present. So uh, that covers the first point in implication. The second is that now there is um, similar to the first, but um, a, a legal incentive for government to monitor and enforce laws more carefully to prevent pollution at existing facilities. So uh, moving forward. Okay, um, so next point. So to ensure that the amendment protects your community against polluters. It is it is heavily encouraged for communities to use their voices and to um, file suits when necessary. So you know, as I'm sure you know, like courts do not function independently. They they and their interpretations can be swayed by evolving public expectations and demands. So that means basically like um, um well, courts rely on. Um, you know, constitutional interpretations like past precedent and principles in offering direction in the interpretation of rights and in this case, the new Green Amendment. Um, so they're going to base it off of, yes, that past precedent, but advocates and people like us um, have the power to push for uh, uh, a comprehensive and significant implementation of this new right. So, um, yeah, the the way in which you use the law, it it determines how the law in the future can be used. So that's like right now. Uh, 
so something that is of note is that, uh, like on that note, um, as of like today, like it might have changed, <laughs> but as of like today, July 13th, the Green Amendment can only be binding against the government. Um, so that means that, like, as I said, as of today, I'm going to clarify that uh, today it can't be used um, as a suit against a private party, um, but can be filed by private citizens, meaning like us. And I say that can be used against private parties because there is a um, ongoing case, which is against Fresh Air for Eastside versus New York. Um, so in this case, um, community organizations, uh, no, community organization, Fresh Air for Eastside recently brought challenges um, using the, or based on the Green Amendment against a landfill in upstate New York. Um, and in its first challenge, like the first time they brought it up, uh, Fresh Air brought a lawsuit against the state of New York and the New York Department of Environmental Conservation and um, New York City, of, you know, as the primary genera generator of waste, solid waste in landfills. Um, and the, uh, I guess that's a bit debatable, but well, they, to New York City, um, to New York State, I mean, and um, the landfill operator, which was a private Entity. So they alleged that the landfill odor and the greenhouse gas emitted violated the Green Amendment, other laws, and um, let me just check the chat. Okay. <laughs> um, and other um, protections, um, you know, uh, that protect environmental rights. And ruling on a motion to dismiss, the Monroe County Supreme Court um, said that the case against the landfill operator. Um, can't be made and it can only be made against the government. So you have to X out the landfill operator. Um, and based on that interpretations for now, that's how the um, amendment can be used. Um, but um, I guess moving on from that though, to the last point is that something that you should know and I, and I think it's very important for us all to be aware of is that the Green Amendment uh, is that the Green Amendment is very likely to bolster any potential suit or petition filed against a state agency. So when you're filing a suit, you need to have standing. You need to claim that an action is in violation of X, Y, and Z rights and statutes. And um, before you had X, Y, and Z, I'm sure, like for example, you had CICRA if it applied, right? Um, but now you can also, if it applies, add that the action is in violation of your New York State constitutional right, your environmental right. Um, and like I said before, you're one of like a handful of U.S. states that can say that, you know, um, as like. Uh, you're one of few states that have this right. So you're one of few states that could have this right violated in that regard. So like I said, it broadens your agency, it broadens your standing. And that is very um, something to keep in mind when moving forward and navigating life in New York state. Um, and that is, um, but I feel like to get a better standing of, yes, the intent and um, insight, let's start off with like how and with what mindset and all that, um, good stuff was the amendment made and who better, literally who better to speak towards that than the developer um, or the, uh, how do I word this, of working in, in uh, with the environmental clinic at Pace University, Hob Law, um, their professor, professor, distinguished professor, Professor Q. <laughs> so I pass it off to you now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Julie. And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen as well. Okay, and I'd like to start, first of all, Julie, by thanking you so much for the opportunity to be here and all of your colleagues at WEACT for organizing uh, for organizing this. Um, and before I go any further, I will say that any um, involvement that I had in helping with the development and adoption of an environmental right, I stand on the shoulders of decades of advocates, many of whom came from Pace University, and in particular, my, my mentor, Nick Robinson, Pace alumna, um, Maya Van Rossum, who wrote the book, The Green Amendment, it was instrumental in breathing life into Pennsylvania's environmental right. Uh, and Pace alumna, Jimmy May, who founded the Environmental Rights Clinic. Um, at, at, Widener, at Widener Law School. So it has been many, many 
many, many um, advocates um, over a very long period of time uh, working in this regard. Um, so what I wanted to, to start with a little bit is to give us maybe a little bit of a um, deep background on the development and adoption of New York's environmental right. And so that there are actually two ways that you can amend New York State's constitution. The way that the um, environmental right, the Green Amendment was adopted is that two successive legislatures passed um, a statute to amend the constitution and then 70% of voters um, uh, voted to adopt that amendment to the constitution. There's actually another way to amend New York's constitution, which is, I think it's every 20 years, I may have the, 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 the interval wrong, um, but New Yorkers can vote or vote on whether to hold a constitutional convention, which reopens or opens up the entirety of the constitution to amendment. Um, I first got involved in the development of an environmental right in New York um, when New Yorkers were considering, I think it was back in maybe 2017, 2016, um, were deciding whether to vote to hold a constitutional convention and to undertake a much larger uh, reimagining of the New York State Constitution. Part of that process, the New York State Bar Association put together a task force and we were asked to evaluate New York's constitution from an environmental perspective. Something that was fascinating to me, we had a group of environmental attorneys from around the state, um, is that there were some attorneys who were adamantly opposed to a convention in part because there are specific provisions in New York State's constitution, the, the so-called forever wild provisions that protect and prevent development of forested lands in the Adirondacks. And from their view, those were so, those constitutional protections were so powerful and important that they were concerned that if a convention was held, special interests might be able to weaken those protections. On the other hand, when our task force looked around the United States, we saw that there were some other states that had much more powerful language and environmental rights in their constitutions that had actually been beneficial. Um, and so we thought those could be beneficial in, in New York um, uh, in New York too. So to give you a sense of this, um, New York's environmental right um, appears in Article 1, uh, section as, as Section 19, Article 1 of the Constitution. What may be a little surprising to know is there's actually lovely flowery language about the value of the environment and being protected um, that appears also in Article 4, Section 4. And this is this has um, long been in the New York State Constitution before the adoption of the environmental right in Article 1, Section 19. The difficulty was um, that essentially that Article 4, Section 4 language was held to be non-self-executing, which essentially meant it didn't have any power apart from a statute that a legislature had adopted to give it um, uh, to give it um, effect. And um, uh, as such, and I apologize, I realized I forgot to start my timer, so I'm belatedly starting it. Um, <clears throat> so as a result, um, uh, that meant that there, there was language in the New York State Constitution talking about the environment generally, but it hadn't been particularly powerful or effective in any real uh, or meaningful uh, way. So to give you a sense, when we talk about our right being in Article 1, the Bill of Rights, what that means is the environmental right is situated alongside other fundamental rights like um, religious liberty, habeas corpus, uh, freedom of speech, really fundamental, uh, fundamental. And the location in the Constitution will be important to Kurt interpreting and applying the right um, and thinking about what it means and how, uh, how it should apply. I'll make an aside here, which is to say that um, th there's definitely environmental rights are definitely having a moment. Um, and we should understand that um, although this feels very new in New York, um, there are many countries that have the explicit recognition of environmental rights in the Constitution. So this is not kind of consti constitutionally speaking, the inclusion of environmental rights in the Constitution is something that is much more common internationally than it is here domestically in the United States. Um, in terms of, um, there, there are kind of a, a few developments in environmental rights that are really active right now. The first is what you might think of as climate constitutional. So international efforts in particular, and also some here domestically, um, to try to push governments to take action on climate change by invoking constitutional environmental rights. A second piece is what we're starting to see increasingly is a marriage between um, uh, the environment and human rights. So a recognition, the United States, the United Nations General Assembly uh, in 2022 recognized the human right to a healthy environment. 
So that kind of growth or recognition of the connection between human rights and environmental, environmental protection. And so in terms of thinking about it, thank you, Julie, you set this up beautifully already. So I think what I'll probably do is just, I'm going to go on and give a few specific examples of, of some of the um, potential value of environmental rights. But once the leg state legislature adopted a statute um, to amend the constitution to add environmental right, um, we started doing a lot of outreach and talking to state and city bar associations, water groups, community groups, what, and, and thinking about like, why is it, what, what, why would you want to add um, a, an environmental right to the constitution? Um, and there are a few, you know, uh, that, that I think we talked about at the time and, can, and I literally have taken this slide, I think, from those pre-adoption presentations and I'm using it now to give you a sense of the kinds of conversations that were happening as New Yorkers were thinking about whether to vote for the right. Um, so one important value is that um, the existence of the right can allow, uh, invite courts um, to support robust implementation of environmental statutes that legislatures pass. pass. Um, and, and there are some great examples um, uh, of that. Um, there are also great examples of um, kind of the existence of a constitutional environmental right being used to kind of press pause on projects that it turns out ultimately reflected um, special interest capture of a legislature. So let or um, an application of a statute in a way that really would have benefited special interests um, uh, in, a, in an unfortunate um, in an unfortunate way. And that's something we talked a lot about in New York because it was really salient in New York was this idea that is good as, and the first question we'd always get was New York has some of the best environmental laws in the country. Why do we also need an environmental right? And something we talk about is as good as our federal and state environmental laws are, there's some really disturbing gaps. And in the existence of environmental right can help invite the citizenry and courts into the process of filling some of those gaps. So to talk a little bit about those, what I wanna first emphasize when you think about an environmental right, something important to understand is that it is one source of law that exists in a really rich context of other laws, primarily existing state statutes and federal statutes that are designed to protect the environment. I um, mean, it's really just another piece to try to help um, um, as get environmental protection uh, right. And it's really the way these all work together that's, um, uh, that's important. Um, so to give you a specific example of a way in which environmental rights can support the implementation of environmental statutes, I'd point you to, it's actually a trilogy now of Supreme Court cases coming out of the state of Hawaii. Hawaii has some very interesting um, environmental language in their constitution. Um, and those environmental rights have been central um, as Hawaii has struggled with a very specific issue, which is a proposal to build a large biofuels plant that would have burned, burned trees and had very high operational greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and some interesting things come out. I think if you look at um, um, the decisions in that case is that the justices on the Hawaii Supreme Court um, were interpreting and applying laws that the Hawaii legislature had adopted, but in doing so, they in repeatedly invoked Hawaii's environmental right to try to understand what the statutes meant. And the end result was, they first said to the Public Utilities Commission there, you can't approve a project with this volume of emission without adequately considering its impacts on climate change. And then went on, when the Public Utility Commission did go back and look at the climate impacts of the proposed development and said, declined to give it permission to move forward, the Hawaii Supreme Court held the decision in part because it was consistent with the environmental guarantees in Hawaii's constitution. And I can say I was visiting at the University of Hawaii this past semester and had the privilege of hearing the oral arguments before the Hawaii Supreme Court. Those environmental rights, the existence of, and are these, is this statutory interpretation consistent with the environmental rights in Hawaii's constitution came up over and over again. Give you another example, um, and, and I would characterize this as an example of public choice distortions being fixed by rights. And what I mean there is by sometimes our legislature create great laws. Um, sometimes something makes it through the legislature that can that is really designed to help us feel interest. And here it was a provision in a Montana statute that exempted certain um, um, kind of um, 
I guess I, I've forgotten the exact term they're called, exempted certain activities from anti-degradation review. In other words, review uh, that would help to ensure that whatever project was moving forward wasn't going to um, impact high quality waters in the state of Montana. Um, and effectively that, that exemption was in large part due to a large company that wanted to create an, an acid pit gold leach mine um, in a really beautiful, beautiful part of the world. I'm gonna recommend um, a wonderful book about the entire history of the litigation. What this um, decision in Montana uh, illustrates is what I think of as um, a superpower of environmental rights, namely, um, that environmental rights actually can be used, constitutional environmental rights, to strike down a bad piece of legislation uh, by a legislature. It's something unusual that only um, a constitutional right um, can do. Um, so. so I next want to talk about, so what are the legal gaps that we saw in, um, uh, in uh, New York? And I think this was, as I mentioned, um, a very big part of New Yorkers being interested in adopting an environmental right. And this, what I'm showing you here is um, one of the objections we frequently got about why a right, um, uh, it didn't make sense for New York to adopt an environmental, um, uh, an environmental right was the idea that um, maybe there aren't really gaps in New York's environmental law. If there are things that aren't happening right now, it's a conscious choice. It's priority. It's prioritization. We can't do everything all at the same time. Um, and here's why that drives me, drove me a little bit, or or made me sad. And I'll say because if you take that as true, that what it effectively meant is there were certain people we were consistently not putting at the top of the priority list. And if you look at the distribution of environmental harms in New York State and the priorities that were being made in implementation of our existing laws. Again and again and again, uh, low-income and communities of color um, were being left behind in terms of achieving environmental protection. That suggests to me that our priority setting um, wasn't wasn't working, wasn't working properly, and that need to address environmental justice in a more meaningful way was a big gap. Another huge gap was with respect to emerging contaminants like PFAS in our drinking water, a situation where we were applying, as they've written, all of the federal and state laws on the books, and nonetheless, people were being exposed to very high levels of chemicals where there was mounting scientific evidence um, that that was not a risk that anyone would be um, uh, comfortable taking. Um, so I'll take a really short moment. Um, I know we have folks from the Environmental Protection Bureau on the phone and they're much better um, positioned um, to speak to this than I am, but to talk a little bit about interpretation uh, of the right. I think it's um, we have one, as Julie mentioned, um, initial uh, trial court decision um, holding that the right is self-executing. What that means is that the right exists independent of the legislature passing any statute. The legislature doesn't have to pass a statute to give life to the right. The right exists um, and has meaning and substance and power uh, in and of itself. I think it seems pretty clear, and this is also a holding from that case, that the right applies to local governments, it applies to the state, it applies to state agencies. Um, I think there will probably see more litigation on this, but again, coming out of some initial decisions and consistent with my own review of the case law, um, it's probably not enforceable against private parties. So you can't see your neighbor saying, you've been burning your trash at night, it's causing smoke next to me, that that infringes my environmental right. You might be able to see them in nuisance law, but not, not under the environmental right. Um, and it probably doesn't allow for damages remedy, which does that mean? It probably doesn't allow you to sue for money damages as a result of harms that you claim are associated with um, a, a violation of your environmental rights. Um, last thing before I turn the floor over, uh, two thoughts. The first is um, at PACE, we are, we, I'll just take a step back and say we are in the early days. The right exists now more on paper than it does in fact. So we are at the beginning of a process of bringing this right to life in New York State and using kind of legal tools and community work um, to build meaning into it and to create value out of it. We at PACE have created a digital repository that's designed to help assist in those efforts. And I also wanna take a moment to say how excited I am to see representatives from the Environmental Protection Bureau here because 
how the state, our state attorneys and our attorney general office um, approach the right and whether they and understand it, I think will be crucial to how its contours develop over time. So thank you, thank you again uh, very much, and I'm so very much looking forward to hearing uh, from our representatives from the Environmental Protection Bureau. That was that was awesome. Um, yeah, I think it was really cool to hear about the process, the references that went behind it, and just like the overall perspective. So yeah, thank you definitely for, for sharing that. And next, first, we're going to allow for the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was for me to introduce um, Lemo Shulovic, um, as I said. Um, you know, I'll let Lem introduce himself. There you go. Thank you, Julie, um, and thank you to all the organizers at WEAC for convening and hosting this conversation about this really important uh, constitutional amendment that we now have and enjoy in New York State. Um, so my colleague Marie and I are privileged and honored to work for New York State Attorney General Letitia James in the office of the Attorney General of New York. Uh, but what we don't do is speak for the Attorney General or the office. So all the views we express here this evening are our own. Um, so the Environmental Protection Bureau in Attorney General James's office um, really are the litigators and trial lawyers for New York State on environmental matters. And basically what that means is we bring lawsuits in the name of the people of the state of New York to enforce environmental laws, be they federal, state, or local at times, we also defend the state and its agencies when they are sued in court. So uh, we have been very engaged uh, with the Green Amendment since it was adopted by the voters uh, in trying to understand what does it mean affirmatively? What obligations does it uh, add uh, to the body of existing environmental law and regulations uh, that Professor Ku uh, just walked us through. Um, as she said, we do have uh, strong and comprehensive environmental laws in New York, um, but the Green Amendment, I think is fair to say, adds to that and adds to that in a very meaningful way. Um, so, uh, the, uh, you know, the first slide Julie put up uh, on the substance had the text every each person rather each person shall have a right to clean air and water and a healthful environment. That's it. The legislative history that um, accompanied the the statute ultimately that the legislature passed twice to have it go to the voters in a referendum uh in uh, 2021 um doesn't provide a lot of guidance as to how and in what circumstance this uh green amendment uh applies it basically suggests that it doesn't create any new legal right of action um doesn't really say too much about its application um, so we are very humbled uh, and privileged to be involved in the Attorney General's office in fashioning arguments about what this amendment does uh, and doesn't mean. And that's what I just want to uh, share and visit with you all uh, this evening. Um, and let me give a big shout out to you all that are here uh on this summer evening uh, to engage in a conversation about this amendment i think that speaks volumes to you and to the importance of this law in our environmental work um so what i thought i'd do is just briefly 
uh, describe three cases uh, that we are involved with presently. Uh, they are all Green Amendment claims asserted against the state uh, or one of its agencies. Uh, so in these cases, uh, we are defending the state. And I think from this early set of cases, I want to flag uh, what we hope uh, and have argued against the Green Amendment becoming. And that is a vehicle for uh, residents to go to court to compel the state to take action in a particular matter, a particular case. And the, the body of law that that is in tension with is called enforcement discretion. So basically, the legislature passes laws. They are enforced generally by the executive. Uh, we're unique in New York because the attorney general is independently elected, does not answer to the governor, um, but also has broad legal authority to enforce our laws. And from our perspective, environmental enforcement discretion is a very important principle to preserve. And I want to talk a little bit about why we think that is. And uh, Marie is going to give you some specific examples about how the Attorney General's office is using enforcement discretion to advance the cause of environmental justice and environmental equity around New York. So case number one, um, uh, Julie and uh, Professor uh, Ku both mentioned it. Uh, it concerns the High Acres landfill. Uh, the High Acres landfill is in Parrington, Fairport, New York. It's on the suburban edge of Rochester uh, in upstate. Um, and as Julie mentioned, it's a very large landfill operated by, owned and operated by a private uh, company, uh, Waste Management. Um, so the neighbors uh, have had issues uh, with odor from the landfill uh, for quite some time. Uh, DEC has taken enforcement action. Uh, waste management has taken measures to address odor, uh, but the neighbors say they're not enough. They're insufficient. They still are harmed by odors. And also, uh, more broadly, from greenhouse gas, climate change pollution, uh, from methane, uh, which is emitted by landfills. So they sued uh, state DEC, they sued waste management, uh, seeking for the court to compel uh, DEC to take more action uh, to address the odor and greenhouse gas emissions, uh, as well as waste management. So the court, um, agreed with the claim, the plaintiff's claim against DC, allowed that claim uh, to go forward, uh, but as mentioned, uh, ruled that the private party who's operating the landfill, uh, there is no Green Amendment claim against that party. Uh, that decision is on appeal, um, uh, really by all parties, um, I think, each party found something in the judge's order that they disagree with. Um, so how um, our appellate courts will decide some of these issues uh, remains to be seen, but I think this is an important case to watch as it goes up through our courts, because I uh, fully expect that um, uh, this case uh, will go uh, through. Uh, the appeals process is is uh, and possibly up to our highest court, the New York Court of Appeals. Um, so the second case I want to just mention comes up in a different context, but shares some of the same uh, issues that the High Acres landfill case shares. This is a challenge 
an environmental challenge to a federal and state highway project uh, in Syracuse, New York, to remove a decade old interstate viaduct on Interstate uh, I-81 uh, that cuts through downtown Syracuse, uh, north and south, and it cuts through the 15th Ward uh, community in south side of Syracuse, uh, which is a predominantly low income black community. Um, and that community for decades has borne a disproportionate share of air pollution and noise from the traffic. And some of the apartment windows are approximately three feet from the edge of that viaduct. They're incredibly close. Um, and unfortunately, when the viaduct was constructed, it really worked to separate um, low income communities of color in Syracuse uh, from more affluent uh, communities. So after about a nine year process, federal and state government designed a project to reroute through traffic around Syracuse uh, on an existing interstate and to remove the viaduct and replace it with an at grade uh, integrated uh, street level uh, highway. Um, and the communities to the east where the traffic would be rerouted brought a lawsuit under our State Environmental Quality Review Act that Julie mentioned and the Green Amendment and said that uh, this project would increase the air pollution in their communities and uh, that violated uh, their Green Amendment rights. So the judge uh, ruled against state DOT on issues not related to the Green Amendment didn't uh, decide the Green Amendment uh, claim at all. Uh, and that case is up on appeal too. So what do these two cases have in common? They have in common that more affluent communities um, that are not low income, that are not communities of color, have access to private counsel to challenge a government action, uh, one of which um, specifically improves the uh, air, access to clean air, uh, in a disproportionately affected community uh, in, on claims that include a Green Amendment claim. Um, and I think that will be borne out if our courts ultimately conclude that community residents can bring a suit to compel action in a specific case, um, I think, unfortunately, the promise of the Green Amendment will, in significant measure, be uh, derailed uh, by litigation, by more affluent communities who have more ready access to uh, attorneys. Uh, so the third case um, actually is on the reverse side of that. Uh, this is a, a case, um, it's styled People versus Norlight. It is a lawsuit that the state and DEC filed. Uh, we filed on behalf of the state and DEC in October 22 to enforce our air laws and regulations against a facility that um, cooks at very high temperature uh, shale that is then ground and turned into road aggregate. The problem with that operation is that it uh, emits uh, unhealthful air pollution uh, into the surrounding community, which is um, a uh, environmental justice community. So in that case, uh, community groups um, were able to secure counsel. Uh, they successfully intervened in the case to assert uh, damages claims against the private operator of that facility, Norlight uh, Corporation, and also uh, asserted a claim against DEC for not enforcing, um, it's not clear exactly what the contours of that claim are. 
uh, because DC is enforcing in a lawsuit. Um, but I think they have concerns about the pace uh, and the scale and uh, perhaps the ultimate relief uh, sought. Um, they're looking for plant closure rather than compliance with our existing uh, air laws. Um, so that case too uh, will play out in terms of where, how does the Green Amendment apply if it does in the context of uh, a specific operation as opposed to the kind of uh, broader areas uh, that Professor uh, Ku just talk to us about in kind of the circuit breaker category, the gap filling uh, area. Uh, so how this amendment meshes with existing principles of law, uh, like enforcement discretion, like existing uh, environmental statutes and regulations. Does clean air mean not a molecule of air pollution? Does it mean uh, something beyond existing air quality standards. Um, all of those questions remain to be, uh, I think, worked out as this state engages with this amendment and applies it uh, through our court system and in other non-court ways uh, to give it meaning and uh, context. Um, I do just, I see I have a minute left. I want to give you one example of the Green Amendment that I sure wish we had on the federal level when uh, President Trump and his administration was in Washington uh, because they embarked on a major, major rollback of all the federal environmental laws, regulations they could, and we brought uh, scores of actions uh, to stop that. And if we had a federal constitutional green amendment, uh, that cause would have been uh, very much aided. So uh, fortunately, that's not something we've addressed in New York. Hopefully we never will, but institutionally that's certainly possible. And enshrining this right as a Bill of Rights in our state constitution, I think is a very important and meaningful step. Thank you so much. Again, fantastic. Uh, yeah, I appreciated, like, uh, I'm, I'm sure we all appreciated um, your insight. And I also thought it was interesting and important that you addressed um, privilege in a way and how like different privilege accounts for and how you can use uh, or who can use and how it's used. So I think it's also why I think and we act thinks it's important that as much people that know about this right and can use it as possible uh, gives a better shot at um, uh, a beneficial comprehension of the amendment. Um, yeah, thinking further, um, I think it's really important. So thank you for sharing. Um, and to um, continue talking about yeah, that perspective, um, uh, the uh, similar perspective for as Lem. Now we're gonna move on to Attorney General Marie Sherry Shakobo, and I'm going to pass it on to you now to begin. So thank you. Thank you, Julie, um, and other members of WEAC for organizing this really important platform for uh, this discussion. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight some actions that our wonderful staff of attorneys, scientists, and policy advisors have taken um, using our enforcement discretion to advance environmental justice. First, you know, I'm a first generation uh, Haitian American. English was not my first language. It was not the first language of many of my family members and members of various um, immigrant communities. Now, the events surrounding uh, Hurricane Ida that struck New York in September of 2021 highlighted for um, us at the Environmental Protection Bureau um, some of the challenges that people with little to no proficiency in English face. Uh, 
Um, there were reports that many people had no idea that a severe storm was expected and um, that they really should be taking measures to ensure their safety. So as we dug into this, you know, we learned that uh, the wireless emergency alerts um, are currently only available in English and Spanish, which meant basically where does that leave people who speak other languages like Haitian Creole or Korean? So we viewed this um, as a matter of environmental inequity. OK, so um, back in early 2022, our office urged the National Weather Service and the Federal Communications Commission to expand accessibility of the wireless emergency alerts beyond these two languages, that is English and Spanish. Um, I'm very happy to report that in April of 2023, the FCC announced a proposal to significantly expand multilingual um, access to the wireless emergency alerts. This is something that we're really excited about because it will allow people to take um, really important life-saving act actions. Um, one of our other priorities is protecting community access to public spaces, to open spaces, I mean, like public parks. And I have two examples of how we've exercised our enforcement discretion to advance environmental justice in this sphere. Last summer, uh, 2022, we had the opportunity to take action in a matter involving um, the proposed sale of a nine acre park in the village of Freeport on Long Island. Back in July 22, 2022, the village voted to sell the park for redevelopment as a warehouse uh, distribution center. Uh, the park, known as the Cleveland Avenue Park, was a primary uh, recreational site for local residents and students of the Freeport Public Schools. Now, why did we see the need to advance environmental justice in this matter? Well, it turns out the population in the area surrounding the park is over 80% people of color and directly across the street from the park is a public housing unit home to many children and other residents who rely on that park for recreation. Additionally, um, the Freeport Public Schools use the park for sporting events. Now, just to put this in context for you, a football field is just over um, an acre. So the community was at risk of losing basically the equivalent of about nine football fields. So a legal battle, you know, took place between the village and the school district among um, title to who owns uh, and has access and control over the land. So all of this caused um, opponents to basically kick the issue up to Governor Hochul urging her to veto a bill that had been introduced um, to allow development on the park. Now, before I get to our involvement in this matter, I have to say something about this parkland alienation issue. Um, so th there's a doctrine called the public trust doctrine, um, which basically states that you can't sell a park without legislative approval. So this bill that was introduced would have basically paved the way for the park to have been sold. Um, so we thought about this in our office. You know, we needed to find a way to get involved, a legal hook. Um, not only did the loss of open space concern us, but so did you know the other impacts that are associated with development and operation of a warehouse distribution facility. So. When we learned that the village was not going to require an environmental review, okay, that is, you know, in the form of an environmental impact statement um, in connection with approving the sale 
of uh, the park, we brought a proceeding challenging that determination. Well, in December uh, 2022, Governor Hochul um, vetoed the legislation to remove uh, the, the park's parkland uh, designation. So as a result, the village revoked its contract to sell the park, and um, we agreed to discontinue our uh, action against the village. Um, in a second matter, we sought to hold uh, parties responsible for the closure of Roberto Clemente Park in Brentwood, Long Island. The park had been closed for three years for remediation because tens and ten tons of thousands of uh, illegal uh, C and D debris containing very hazardous substances was dumped in the park. And a lot of this material came from construction sites um, in New York City. So back in 2017, uh, we filed an action against about 34 individuals responsible for the unlawful dumping. And um, to date, I can report that we've obtained about um, uh, $1.3 million um, in settlement funds with about 15 of those defendants. And we have partnered with local advocates to ensure that the um, settlement funds go towards projects um, in or around the park. Finally, I'd like to highlight our um, continued commitment to addressing urban air pollution, particularly from heavy duty vehicles like buses and trucks. Um, what we have found is that the lots where these vehicles are often parked and um, engaging in the illegal conduct um, are usually located in environmental justice communities where rates of asthma and other respiratory illnesses are really unacceptably high. Illegal engine idling is generally um, a trigger, as many of you know, for respiratory incidents and um, hospital visits. As many of you may know, our office has been investigating school bus companies in New York City um, for idling in violation of state and New York City idling limits for years, okay? Um, one of our recent targets is Hoyt Transportation Company. Um, it's a bus company that operates a fleet of about 300 school buses in a low-income community in the Bronx. Um, during our investigation, we obtained um, really good data um, by Geotab, and this is the um, fleet management system that the Department of Education um, has installed on all New York City school buses. Um, and for those of you who have not had an opportunity to read some of our press releases on this matter, I'd like to share just some of that little bit of that data with you. So between October 13th and um, December 20, 2019, um, one of uh, Hoyt's buses idled for over two hours on 13 separate occasions um, at one of their yards on Randall Avenue um, in the Hunts Point neighborhood in the Bronx. That exact same bus, okay, idled 83 other times at the same yard um, with an average of 16 minutes each time. Now, the data also showed us that um, another one of their buses idled 51 times um, at that same uh, depot on Randall Avenue, averaging about 25 minutes each time. Now, three of these insta instances were also over two hours in duration. Now, let me remind you that New York state law um, prohibits idling for more than five minutes, and New York City law prohibits idling for more than three minutes, and there is a one-minute uh, restriction when a bus is right near um, a school. 
So the data basically clearly showed that Hoyt um, had repeatedly and persistently exceeded city and state idling limits um, at their yards. Now we ultimately settled um, with Hoyt in October of 2022 um, and the settlement that we reached um, broadly speaking, um, requires uh, Hoyt to implement extensive idling training program for their drivers, um, engage in idling management, engage an idling manager to monitor idling behavior and to pay um, about $38,000 um, in penalties. And Hoyt is also required um, to pay another 66,000 uh, dollars if they um, do not enter into an agreement to purchase an all-electric uh, school bus by May of 2025. Um, so the last matter that I'm going to talk about um, in, actually involved discussions that I and a colleague of mine um, engaged in with members of uh, WE Act. Um, Back in January of this year, we learned that a real estate developer, Bruce Teitelbaum, opened a truck depot at a vacant gas station in Harlem, um, which I believe is on the corner of 145th and Lenox Avenue. Um, Teitelbaum opened the depot after his plans for a large, very large scale housing complex um, fell through. And it's, it's our understanding that he withdrew his application um, with the city council after failing to obtain uh, support of some of the council members. Now, on that opening day in January, Teitelbaum had a few trucks parked at the gas station. And of course, this generated significant media attention. Um, if he were to convert the parcel where the gas station sits and some of the adjoining parcels, um, the lot basically would be able to accommodate about 200 uh, trucks, depending on their size. Um, now, if, if you think about it, that number of vehicles would be associated with um, significant okay, traffic delays, noise, safety concerns for pedestrians, and of course, air pollution. So after our call with uh, members of uh, WEAC staff, we at the AG's office tried to figure out what we could do. Okay. Um, we realized that the truck depot is a permitted use of the site, which, you know, under city regs is zone eight. Um, and that designation basically allows for commercial uses. Um, and because of that designation, no environmental review um, is required. So what did we do? Okay. Now, sometimes our work does not involve taking legal action in the form of filing a lawsuit. Marie, Marie I just want to let you know that we are, um, uh, this is time-wise. I'm out of time? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I will go. wrap this up in one minute. Okay. We wrote a letter to the developer um, informing him about the health impacts of truck traffic and that operation of the depot would create a public nuisance. And we also... Uh, reminded him of his obligations as an owner of the lot with respect to idling laws. Um, he responded, uh, agreed to be mindful of his obligations under the law. We've since performed some site visits, um, and I'm happy to report that so far we are not aware of any violations or a basis to take any legal action. Thank you, Marie. <laughs> That was fantastic. And I also think it was very empowering to hear about um, like what like this with the state, I guess, in that regard, well, not on behalf of the state, but like to get insight on how on the justice and environmental justice initiatives in that way. Uh, and um, yeah, I believe like hearing about that depot is actually where the conversation of, oh, can the Green Amendment be applied is where this even conversation even started. So it's I think it's very full circle. Um, 
yeah I, I don't think it can that sounds like a well yeah uh but yeah it still stands that you know i think it's very important um to have an idea of what rights and what actions are being taken as it relates to environmental protections and environmental justice as a whole um so let's move on to any like comments questions that came up during this time i'm going to look into the chat um I see the, uh, the first question is related to, I'm, I'm assuming, um, uh, Professor Ka's, um presentation. So if you would mind sharing, um, what was it like to get, I think you touched on it, but what was it like to get the community involved? Uh, I guess that's the first part of the question. And then also, you know, what were the barriers, difficulties that came up and how did it help um, at different stages? What was it like to get um, the community involved? The most fascinating thing to me in talking to community groups is I had to start every presentation explaining to people that they didn't already have a right to a healthy environment. Somehow, people just assumed they already had that right. So I had to start by, by unpacking that and saying, actually, as it exists today, if the legislature were to adopt a law revoking our Safe Drinking Water Act protections or whatever it might be, right, your only recourse would be through the democratic process, try to elect different legislators, right? The people just didn't, you had to start by educating people that they, because I think our sense is so fundamental to us, this concept, this idea um, that we should have, or of course we have these rights, that every conversation had to start with explaining that that right didn't already exist, except to the extent that it had been enshrined in law through a statute. And that those statutes can be repealed, those statutes can be amended, and those statutes can be interpreted in ways that maybe aren't consistent with their original intent or applied in ways that aren't consistent with that intent. So um, that was an interesting aspect of it for me. In terms of the power of um, talking to um, communities, now I will say I sat there on um, election night, refreshing, refreshing, refreshing the vote count, and seeing it come in at 70 percent was was enormously gratifying. And I think my hope is that you know part of bringing the right to life in a meaningful way in New York, um, Julie, to your point, and Lem to your point as well, is to make sure um, that the communities that need this protection the most are educated and engaged and know how to use it. And I would encourage communities to to, to understand this as. Um, in my sense, the right is least valuable in litigation. It is most valuable in communications and conversations with regulators when you're talking about the issuance of a permit in a particular um, uh, in a particular community. Um, to I, I would say cajole regulators to, to courage, right, and and encourage stringent limits and encourage robust interpretations of existing laws that are protective and that meet community needs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going on to the next question, and this is for um, either of the AGs, and it is how is the uh, state promoting this right? Like to that point we just mentioned about having as much people know as possible. Like, what is the how are people hearing about it? I guess from your networks. Yeah. So. Um... One of the things that we uh, do uh, at the Attorney General's office is quite a lot of outreach, um, specifically to frontline environmental justice communities, environmental justice advocates, um, environmental groups uh, more broadly. Um, and uh, kind of part of that outreach uh, will increasingly be a discussion about the Green Amendment. Um, it's relatively new, um, but as it now is enshrined in our law, as Professor Q just really eloquently said, it is a very powerful tool for community advocacy to improve environmental conditions in their community, and particularly communities of color and low-income communities, because every person in New York is not 
equitably treated when it comes to clean air, clean water, and a healthy environment. So uh, incorporating the Green Amendment along with other uh, outreach efforts is, is uh, certainly something I think is going to be uh, an increasing part of at least our outreach. Mm -hmm. Um, so before we move on, I just want to remind everyone that um, I am reading off what has been, well, my phone doesn't show on the screen screen. Uh, I am reading off what is um, being put in right now, but if anyone, anyone hasn't had a chance to, to share their question, now is the time. We have about five minutes left in this presentation, so, you know, take a shot while you got it. Um, so um, next question, I think, is back to Professor Ka, and it is, how did you navigate um, any pushback that you received? Um, so I think one way we navigated pushback, and, and I think like I in my presentation, I mentioned that one pushback we got is that um, this will lead to a flood of unnecessary litigation um, in New York, and we already have really strong environmental laws here. And there were two ways we kind of thought about this, and I didn't, just, I didn't dismiss these concerns out of hand. I was also concerned about that possibility. So what we did is we actually went and looked at states that already have strong environmental rights provisions in their constitutions and literally tallied up, here's the number of cases they have in a given year, and it's, and it's not a tsunami of litigation. Um, so it, it, to kind of demonstrate that you can have this tool in your constitution, it can exist alongside um, and in tandem and synergistically with environmental statutes and laws without having the courts completely take over uh, environmental protection. So we looked to other states that had these rights and looked at the volume of litigation they had and what it was doing on the ground to say, hey, the sky won't fall. The sky's not falling if we adopt this. Um, and you know, I do think a second powerful point that we um, uh, that we made when we kind of one of the from attorneys, one of the biggest pieces of pushback that we got was this idea that um, to the extent that you know that, and this I think relates a little bit to what Lemus Lemus was saying about the concerns that the AG office still has is. Well, we, we can't do everything immediately. And so we have to have the discretion to prioritize and, and make choices. And I think one of the strongest um, arguments uh, or for the existence of a tool that at least in extreme cases can exist and allow for legal pushback um, is the idea that you know, we have some really strong evidence based on uh, on the ground environmental conditions that kind of current decisions about prioritization have left some communities consistently behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so this next question, I feel like it, I mean, um, Lemmer, Marie can answer. I think it's for Marie is, um, so it seems like how is the Green Amendment discussed by the state through an EJ lens? I'm, I'm assuming that means like maybe not to the public, but amongst yourselves. How is it discussed? That's how I'm reading it. I'll defer to Lem on that. <laughs> well, um, I think there are a couple of ways. Uh, one is that it supports uh, our enforcement prioritization of enforcing our environmental laws and regulations in environmental justice communities. Um, so it helps ex support that, and it helps, I think, expand that uh, that work. So that's one way. Um, we also are thinking hard about perhaps it may apply to private parties. We have a decision out of uh, Monroe County Supreme Court in Rochester that said it doesn't. That's not going to be the final word on it. What that looks like, we don't know. It doesn't say that it applies to private parties. And constitutional amendments um, generally limit government action, not private action, but there are some exceptions there. So that's one of the things also that is very much in discussion because environmental data is not uh, kept on what is uh, the relative uh, amount of emissions or pollution from government actors versus private actors. Um, that's not how it's tabulated. And, you know, government operations uh, generate pollution. 
uh, the state and city and every city has a fleet of automobiles and trucks and all kinds of things, right? Um, but if you look at the relative contribution of uh, air and water pollution and the uh, emission of harmful chemicals, uh, the ratio between government uh, pollution and private pollution is overwhelmingly uh, on the private side. So we're uh, engaged in a in an internal discussion. What what might that look like? How uh, could that apply? Um, and I think that's something that is going to engage us, you know, for for quite uh, a long time in the future as this. Uh, incredibly important constitutional right gets fleshed out in our state. Thank you, Lem. Um, and um, our time is basically up, so I'm going to just ask this last question. And uh, it is for Pace. Um, just for face. Um, and I, but I feel like anyone can answer this question. I feel like we did touch on it, but just in case maybe there's something still to be said, is that were there any unexpected interpretations um, of the amendment? I will say one concern that's been raised about the amendment is the possibility that it could be invoked by communities to resist um, the construction of renewable energy um, sources that would support New York reaching its climate goals. Um, and so that's a concern that's been raised. I don't think we've actually seen any um, uh, cases kind of brought in that regard. Um, and so I think it's more of a theoretical concern than, than an actual one um, at this point. Um, but I would, I would say to my mind, that would be kind of um, a somewhat unusual or unexpected invocation of the amendment that obviously has environmental concerns on both sides. Um, yeah. Any other comments? So uh, just real quickly, I've been suing polluters for 30 years and been defending the state for a lot of years. So nothing has been surprising yet. Uh, we have a very robust litigation uh, bar in in the environmental arena in New York and very talented litigators. I'm sure I will be surprised in perhaps the next case, um, but that's what uh, really, I think, gives vibrancy and uh, uh, some real sense of uh, excitement uh, about what this amendment can do and will do uh, in our state. Okay, this last question is just me. I'm just curious. Do you guys have questions for each other? The panelists? Uh, I don't have a question, but uh, I really uh, appreciate the points made and the thoughts by uh, Professor Ku. I really, really appreciate that. And uh, it's great to meet you here remotely in this uh, important conversation. Same here. <laughs> Yeah, I would just add I'd love to keep keep the um the conversation going because I, I really do have high hopes for the amendment and seeing it really grow in a in a robust way in New York. And you all are on the front lines um, of doing that. So thank you. And just like uh, I'm going to repeat what Mary Lady put in the chat, but that is that is basically it for a discussion. Before that, I just want to say yes again. Um, become a WEAC member. We're going to have a lot of conversations um, in this realm. Um, like I said again, um, the event on demystifying grassroots work um, through the lens of legal standing and uh, my, uh, you think I know the title by now and community engagement. Basically talking about like closing the gap between um, big gr big green environmental law and grassroots and making them work together a bit more and having that like conversation things will be very spicy so if you want to see that or be a part of that I'd say to attend um, and okay like um, Lana Del Rey said once and now Lem it is a hot summer night so thank you for joining us on a night like this and to being part of this conversation. And um, thank you all for your time. I hope you got a chance to snag the contacts that were available. Um, and uh, here, I'll put my email in the chat.
don't get confused when you see paste them because I use it. I use it all the time. Outlook is amazing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, if you have any questions, comments, please use that um, contact information. And besides that, it's a wrap. So thank you all for being here. Bye.